Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Suzanne McGurn. I'm uh, the President and Chief Executive Officer at Cadeth. I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to our webinar today. Um, I'll be moderating today's session on developing COVID-19 vaccine. As we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today from Ottawa, Canada, which is on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonqu Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. And I would encourage everyone on the call to pause and reflect on the land from which you are participating in today's event from. Today's topic, um, the COVID-19 pandemic has altered virtually every aspect of our lives from where we work to how we shop, to how we socialize, to how we vacation. We are facing global economic upheaval and widespread uncertainty on matters large and small. The greatest uncertainty has to do with when this will all end. Experts agree that a vaccine, actually a number of vaccines, is perhaps the best hope for the ending the pan pandemic, but that could still be a long way off. And so the greatest challenge right now is how to expedite the development of COVID-19 vaccine without compromising Canada's high standards for safety, efficacy, and quality. We have three great speakers with us today who are going to take us inside this unprecedented push to develop a COVID-19 vaccine. Outlining their roles and responsibility of the industry, regulators, and public health practitioners. Our speakers, Dr. Dion Neem, the country medical lead and country medical head for vaccines with Sanofi Canada. Megan Bettle, a PhD Director, Center for Regulatory Excellence, Statistics and Trials, Biologic and Radiopharmaceuticals uh, Drugs Directorate, a Health Products and Food Branch, Health Canada, and Dr. Monica Noss, Medical Director, Communicable Diseases and Immunization Services, and Medical Head Immunization Programs and Vaccine Preventable Disease with BC Center for Disease, Disease Control. Our speakers will provide a general overview of the vaccine development from R&D to implementation of a new major vaccine pro program. Please note they will not be talking about specific products in development. As we proceed through the presentation today, we would ask you to hold all questions until after uh, all three speakers. Sorry, let me rephrase that. I'm used to not doing this on Zoom. We'll hold questions until after all three speakers. However, while they are speaking, you can submit your questions at any time by clicking on the Q&A tab in the Zoom control bar. If you are having any technical issues, please use the Q&A tab to let us know, and the CADETH events team will do their best to try and help resolve them for you. Each of our speakers is going to take approximately uh, 10 minutes, um, and so we're going to start with R&D. So over to you, Dr. Neem. Great. Uh, thank you very much uh, for having me. I really do appreciate the opportunity. I would also like to say that because I've noticed on the attendance list, there's a lot of my colleagues from McMaster, that I'm from McMaster, a Department of Pediatrics, and I do my professorship through there. Um, so I, what I'll do right now, starting with my first slide, I'm just going to funnel my way into vaccines because there's been a tremendous amount of work that's been done um, to support uh, COVID-19. It's been a, a very positive uh, um, stakeholder engagement where people are working together to, to, to fight uh, the pandemic. Uh, when we look at the different sort of buckets that are involved with, with um, innovations for healthcare, there's diagnostics, there's treatments, and there's vaccines. Next slide. When we look at treatments and vaccines, focusing on treatments, I mean, the treatments, and Megan will uh, talk to you about this a little bit more, I, I suspect, but we've been looking at licensed products which may have an indication uh, for COVID-19. And uh, clinical trials have been in place for those. And we've looked at um, many different types, but really the antivirals and the anti-inflammatories have, have been the, the areas that we focused on. We may not have had as much success as we were hoping for, but that has that's fine. Um, we we're still doing proper clinical trials, but that's kind of turned the focus a little bit more on vaccines. Now we've had a number of different candidate vaccines. I mean, I've heard numbers starting at like 80, 90, over 100, 130s on this slide. I've heard over 150. I think what's most important there though is that there's about 30 uh, that are actually um, looking at clinical trials, whether it be phase one, phase two, and some um, hopefully soon jumping into phase three trials. Next slide. So 
So before I dive into uh, the vaccines them, themselves, I, I feel it's really important to understand the natural viral infection pathway because our, our own immune system um, and it, how it develops immunity is really the basis of, of how we generate vaccines. So let's use, surprisingly, let's use uh, COVID, uh, coronavirus as an example. So coronavirus is a respiratory virus and it uh, enters obviously through the, through the respiratory system and it invades at the level, at many levels, but generally it invades at the level of um, the inner lining of the lungs, uh, also known as the respiratory epithelium. So why does the virus do that? Well, viruses are just extremely small microorganisms and in order to uh, reproduce, they need to utilize our cellular machinery. So when the virus gets down to the respiratory cell epithelium, um, it has something, as we've heard, I'm sure, much of the S protein. Now, the S protein is part of the virus, and it attaches into a receptor that's on the respiratory epithelium, and that's known as the ACE2 receptor or the angiotensin converting enzyme receptor. It does that because it wants to lock into the epithelial surface because it wants to, uh, through the um, endocytotic process, it wants to actually enter the cell. When it enters the cell, it joins with a vesicle and that vesicle then opens up the virus and the virus releases its genetic material. Um, by releasing its genetic material, it can then produce uh, generally proteins um, that will allow it to then uh, reproduce and exit the cell. Now, the exiting of the cell is called an exocytotic process. So that's the virus. That's what the virus does. It enters our cell in order to reproduce and exits the cell. As it exits the cell though, the second process occurs and that's our own immune system understanding that, wait a minute, there's something in our body that's not actually supposed to be there. And there is a, we have an innate immune system, which is more of a general immune system and we have adaptive immune system. The innate immune system has a number of different cells uh, called macrophages and they will go around trying to sort out what's foreign and what's non-foreign in our body. If it sees the coronavirus in our body, it will grab hold of it um, and it will then convert into what a cell called an, uh, an antigen presenting cell, which is fairly self-explanatory. The macrophage then takes a uh, part of that virus, the coronavirus, and it shows it, it presents it. It's antigen presenting, antigen that usually a protein presenting it to what we call uh, helper T cells. Now the helper T cells then will maneuver um, into three different areas. Uh, the, first, uh, the first area that it'll look at is um, a production of antibodies. And that's a communication that it'll have with a B cell or a B lymphocyte. So the B lymphocytes will then generate antibodies to that protein or that antigen, which was presented to it. Those antibodies then have an ability to fight the, the virus. They fight the virus in an op opsonization. It just crowds the virus, it jumps on the virus, not allowing it to go into cells or in fact, actually killing the virus. The next stage that it can do is it actually can um, communicate with what we call cytotoxic T cells. And they're also known as killer T cells. And they actually can recognize respiratory cells uh, that already have the virus in it. And they'll go ahead and they'll destroy the virus. Now, the third thing that happens, which is really where we are looking in regard to vaccines, is it can provide memory. It can provide memory in the T cells. It can provide memory in the B cells. And these are uh, cells that kind of patrol our body. So if on a subsequent infection, if it sees a uh, coronavirus or something that's very similar to the coronavirus, our memory cells will jump on it right away and, and, and will kill the virus so it can't cause effect. Next slide. Okay. So when we're looking at a production of a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine or the COVID-19 vaccine candidates, we we can look at it in a number of different ways. Once again, utilizing the natural immune system, um, we can produce uh, viruses which are very similar to the infecting agent. We can actually provide viral or genetic material. Uh, we can actually uh, vector or carry viral material uh, to, to our, um, uh, through our body to our immune system, or we can provide antigens. Now we tend to break that into virus or virus-like nucleic acid, vector uh, viral vectors or protein based. Now I'll go into these individual and I'll give you a little bit of an explanation of them. So next slide. 
So when we talk about uh, virus vaccines, these are sort of the traditional and older vaccines. Um, and you may recognize many of this. So you can have a, a weakened virus. Um, and that's uh, what they do is they take the wild virus and they put it through passages. And this passage forces mutations. Now you'll eventually get to a place where the mutated virus will not cause disease, but it will in fact cause antibodies. And those antibodies will be able to recognize the wild type virus, which you started with before the passages. And so therefore it will neutralize that wild virus and, um, and, and, and prevent it from causing disease. Then you have inactivated viruses on the right side of the screen. Now the inactivated viruses are similar uh, to maybe a polio virus uh, in the old days. And so when, when we say inactivated, it is actually the virus, but it's just rendered uninfectious. It, chemically treated um, uh, by formaldehyde like they do in flu vaccines or heat. Um, the weakened virus, just to pop back to that on the left, that would be similar to things like our measles, mumps and rubella vaccines. Uh, next slide. So the next slides are, are really quite interesting and, and are, are fairly uh, new. Uh, these are viruses that uh, because of the technology that we have today that you know, we're able to decipher the nucleic acid sequencing of our, the genetic material within viruses known as the, the mRNA, the messenger RNA. Uh, and what they actually do is we're going to insert this, uh, this nucleic acid uh, portion of the, in this case, the SARS-CoV-2, and we're going to place that into cells um, for, for the cell then to use its cellular machinery to produce the protein. So for example, if you look down at the bottom on the right hand side, you see the RNA. So the RNA of the SARS-CoV-2 is actually placed into kind of a lipid coat, a uh, nanolipid particle. This uh, allows it to permeate the membrane. As you can see on the diagram, it's going into the membrane. And then the RNA is released. Now there's a number of different RNAs. There's an mRNA, which is what we've just given, but there's rRNA, ribosomal RNAs, and there's tRNA, transfer RNAs. The mRNA simply is a message, it's a code of a protein. And so you have this string of nucleic acids and every three nucleic acids actually code for an amino acid. Uh, so when you have the message attached, uh, messenger RNA attached to the ribosomal RNA, and then you have a transfer RNA, which brings down the amino acid, which is being coded for on this three amino acid seg or three nucleic acid segment called a codon. So now you've got all these transfer RNAs bringing together a whole sequence or string of amino acids. That amino acid, once released, then will take a conformational change due to positives and minuses on the, on the different amino acids, but it will be the production of, in this case, the S protein. The S protein then will go out of the cell and it will be um, uh, found by a, a antigen presenting cell. It will produce the, um, it will present the um, antigen, this S protein in this case, to a T helper cell, and then the production of uh, antibodies, et cetera, uh, like in the natural system will occur. Next slide. So now we have um, the viral vector vaccines. Uh, viral vector vaccines are, are really interesting technology as well too. So they're actually taking um, replicating or non-replicating viruses, which have been rendered um, uninfective, and they're adding in the, that nucleic acid I was talking about, that RNA portion, and they're actually then being put into the, the, the vaccine and they're being given to the person. So they go through that natural process, although they're not gonna cause diseases, it could be a weakened measles or it could be like an adenovirus. It goes into a respiratory cell, goes through that whole process we talked about at the front end of the presentation, and it will produce um, this, this virus. But in the cases, in this case, we've actually placed in that mRNA. So it will produce an S protein that will ex exit the cell. And once again, our friend, the antigen presenting cell will grab hold of it and it will present that S protein to the immune system and the immune system will develop a response. So you can see there's sort of a lot of commonalities in these types of things. Next slide. The final kind of classification, which has been used fairly frequently uh, in vaccine technology over the years, is the protein-based uh, vaccines. Also, you could say they're polysaccharide-based vaccines as well, too. So what we're doing in this case is we understand that 
there are certain proteins uh, or polysaccharides that are on the cell walls of, of viruses, which are the really immunogenic. They're the real antigen. So why give the whole thing when you can just give a portion of it? So what we actually do is we produce these proteins outside of the body. Um, there's different systems that do that. They can be human or they can be uh, um, insect. Uh, they can be all kinds of different systems. And they produce those proteins. And what we do with the vaccine is we take those proteins, we place them in a vial, we give those to people. And once again, the, uh, the, the immune system, natural immune system looks at that and goes, well, that's foreign, that protein shouldn't be here. So the antigen presenting cell grabs it, presents it to the T4 cell, T4 cell or the helper cell, and then uh, the immune system response uh, is in play. Next slide. So that's really the basis of my talk. I only had 10 minutes, so I hope I didn't go too fast. But so COVID-19 vaccines in development, there is at least four basic groups. And within each of the four basic groups, there's, a, there's two different sort of types. And so when we look at that in totality, we have the, the virus-like vaccines, which are inactivated or weakened. We have the vector, um, viral vector vaccines, which are sort of replicating or non-replicating, but are actually dropping in uh, the genetic material that they have um, been given, uh, the mRNA in this case for COVID-19, and they're causing production of the proteins. We have the nucleic acids, which are very simple, and they're very simply are the messenger, are the messenger uh, RNA that's going to produce the protein. And then we have protein-based, which is we're going to find something that's very antigenic on the, on, the, on the virus, and we're going to just provide that, and we'll generate that immune system response. So I think that the whole point of this though, is that all vaccines aim to um, expose, you know, the, bot, the person to something that will not cause disease, but will provoke an immune system response. And in that provoking of the immune system response, they will provide a memory so that when the real uh, virus comes along, the one that's going to cause some morbidity or mortality, we'll have an understanding of what it is and we'll attack it right away and we'll kill it. And so we won't have uh, any of any negative effects, any untoward effects. So thank you very much. I hope that kicks us off nicely. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Neem. Um, appreciate a very difficult uh, topic to squeeze into 10 minutes. So thank you. A reminder that we're holding the questions until after all three presentations, but please do send your questions on to me uh, through the Q&A tab. I'd now like to turn it over to Dr. Megan Battle, who will provide an overview of the regulatory aspects of vaccine development. Okay, thanks very much. And uh, thanks to Dion for starting us off. I will admit that I was a little distracted by watching the numbers of participants go up as you were speaking. So we're now at over a <laughs> thousand, which is really exciting. Uh, if we can go on to the next slide, please. So what I'm gonna talk about really is what has Health Canada been doing and, and what do we as the regulator um, do to support uh, assessment of vaccines and eventually bringing uh, vaccines to the Canadian market. So I will say that we've had a very busy spring. So since even before the, uh, the declaration of the official pandemic, Health Canada has been working very hard to engage with Canadian and international manufacturers, of not just of vaccines, but also of potential treatments as well, um, to provide advice and to review and authorize uh, clinical trials which were to be conducted in Canada. We've also had a lot of policy work going on and developing some new regulatory tools uh, to make our processes a bit more agile. Regulators um, are not necessarily always known for being agile and fast, but in, and we certainly are working on that uh, in this circumstance to respond to what's really a crisis. So we've been looking at our tools, first of all, to support um, clinical trials that are going to be conducted in Canada. And we're also looking at what we need to put in place to make sure that we can do um, an expedited review and bring treatments and vaccines to Canadians as quickly as possible. So Suzanne always already said these words once, I will say them about 10 more times <clears throat> through my talk and I'll apologize for that, but safety, efficacy and quality of products is really, really important and will continue to be the focus of all of our activities. So we go to the next slide, please. So we'll start with clinical trials. Um, so Health Canada regulates clinical trials, phase one, two, and three trials that will be conducted in Canada. 
This falls under Division 5 of the Food and Drug Regulations, which is basically a clear framework for how an experimental drug can be used in Canada. Vaccine trials are reviewed by the Biologic and Radiopharmaceutical Drugs Directorate, which is my home organization. So every clinical trial that's going to be done in Canada must be reviewed to see if it meets the requirements of Division 5. And what we're really looking for here is protection of trial participants. That's the main point of the review. Is this trial going to be safe for the people who take part in it? We're also looking at um, the, the design of the trial and is it uh, designed and set up in such a way that the trial will actually answer the questions that are being asked. So if the trial isn't going to meet those objectives, Health Canada, Health Canada can say no, we can stop that trial from starting in Canada. So with COVID-19 trials, we have been working very quickly to talk to sponsors. So if, um, if a drug manufacturer or somebody who wants to conduct a, a clinical trial in Canada is looking for scientific advice, we can hold those advice meetings within a week of the first request. And we normally have a 30 day timeline for the review of clinical trials. For COVID clinical trials, our, our target is less than half of that normal time. So we're aiming for less than, than two weeks. And we're actually to have been doing it much more quickly than that. We've really been throwing a lot of people and a lot of uh, people's evening and weekend times uh, at these clinical trial applications so that trials can start as quickly as possible after a thorough review. Health Canada does not design trials. So we require people to come to us with a protocol, with a plan, and to ask questions so we can provide scientific advice to help, uh, to help uh, shape the trial so that it would, be, it would be most appropriate and answer the questions that need to be asked. And finally, while we have to deal with each trial uh, one by one uh, from a regulatory perspective, we do have a dedicated review teams. So we've had the same people looking at all of the vaccine trials, for example. So we have a very consistent approach with what we're looking for from, from the endpoints, from the trial design, and from the quality and manufacturing data that we would expect to see in a clinical trial submission. So next slide, please. So as of yesterday, which was the last time I checked the stats, we had authorized 55 different uh, trials in Canada for COVID-19. These are a range of, of products. Um, some of them are completely brand new. Some of them are existing drugs which are on the market. Uh, there are trials with pharmaceuticals, biologics, including monoclonal antibodies. There are multiple trials using convalescent plasma, so taking the blood from people who have recovered from COVID-19. Um, and, and there's a range of trials as well. So phase one trials, small safety studies through to large um, phase three studies and multinational studies as well. At the end of May, we introduced an interim order to support uh, COVID-19 clinical trials. And this is really a, a regulatory tool to make things simpler, to reduce some of the administrative burden for sponsors of trials, and to do things such as expanding the groups of healthcare professionals who can be the principal investigators, um, or allowing uh, remote or non-written consent, which just gives additional flexibilities in a time when healthcare is frankly a little complicated to deliver sometimes. So far, we have authorized two early phase trials of vaccines specific to SARS-CoV-2. But as Dan mentioned, there are already, I'll just say well over 100 vaccines in development across the world. And as was already mentioned, this huge range of platforms as well. Some of these technologies have not been used before to bring vaccines to market. These will require a lot more attention and review, especially from the manufacturing perspective. Um, whereas other of, others of the vaccines are, are based on well-known technologies. So we're more comfortable with those and we can, we can look at data from products which have already been authorized. Next slide, please. There we go, thanks. Um, so as we've been engaging with people who want to conduct uh, vaccine trials in Canada, what sort of advice are we giving? First of all, we're talking about the possibility of adaptive designs. So starting with a, a phase one study, which is looking at safety and moving seamlessly to uh, a phase two model where uh, you can also assess some endpoints uh, looking at efficacy. 
we're recommending that as, as the trial design start slow and build so that small groups of, of people are exposed to a vaccine and then there's a, a safety review before moving on to to the next stage so for example before moving on to a higher dose Initial trials need to start with a young, healthy adult population before older, risk older or higher risk populations are included. And every trial has to have a very strong safety monitoring plan, including specific monitoring for something that's called vaccine-induced disease enhancement, which so far is a theoretical risk um, associated with vaccines for coronavirus, but is something that, that regulators are looking at very closely. There should be long-term follow-up of uh, all participants who receive the vaccine for at least six months and, and usually beyond. Most, most trials we see uh, are following for at least a year, um, even for the, the early phase ones. And um, looking forward to, uh, to the full development plan for a product, products need to be assessed in all of the populations that they're going to be used in. So studies start in healthy adults, but they also need to be uh, conducted in older populations and in children as well. So right now we're only talking to sponsors mostly about phase one uh, safety studies. It's a uh, Kind of a good news story, we're not actually anticipating a lot of phase three trials of vaccines to be conducted in Canada. We have actually been so good at flattening our curve that there's not enough infection to, to test a vaccine uh, for, for efficacy. So this is good, but this does mean that we'll be looking at data that comes from other jurisdictions. So we can go to the next slide, please. So recognizing that um, studies are, are global and they'll be done worldwide, we do want to make sure that we are collaborating, collaborating internationally so that all of the major regulators are taking the same approach to COVID vaccines. So we work quite closely in a, in a number of fora. We work with the International Coalition of Medicines Regulatory Authorities, which is all the major regulators who get together weekly basically to discuss key products and common evidence standards. We're part of a, a number of working groups organized by the World Health Organization, talking about global vaccine trials, animal models, you know, what will be the best animals to test for certain responses. Health Canada has existing um, work sharing mechanisms with our partners in, in Australia, Singapore, and Switzerland. So this means that we could get a single drug submission or single vaccine submission all the regulators can work together to do that review work, and then uh, products could come to market simultaneously in all of those jurisdictions. And we do work very closely as well with the US FDA and the European Medicines Agency. So all of the regulators are really trying to make sure that we're taking a common approach to um, the development of COVID vaccines and treatments. We'll go to the next slide, please. So I talked about clinical trial authorization. What does it take to bring a product to market in Canada? So market authorization um, has a separate regulatory framework uh, under the food and drug regulations. And we anticipate that there will be additional uh, emergency authorization pathways as well. While the, the review focus of clinical trial authorization is, is that single trial. Market authorization is really looking at a very large body of evidence, including multiple clinical trials at, at all phases and significant chemistry and manufacturing data as well. And that review uh, is really focused on what is the evidence for safety, quality and efficacy before a product can come to market in Canada. And when a product does come to market in Canada, it always comes with risk mitigation measures. So it includes things like product labeling, telling people how to use the product and who it's indicated for, and a very strong post-market surveillance plan as well. So as vaccines or products come onto the market, the tools we use to monitor their safety and to monitor their continued effectiveness. Next slide, please. So the big question uh, that comes up constantly is how long does this take? So normally, if you think about the development of a drug or, or a vaccine, it happens in a number of phases and these tend to be sequential. So a product is developed, it's tested in animals, there's uh, evidence of safety and a proof of concept in the animals. Then we move on to phase one, these safety studies in small groups of people. Then we move on to phase two, um, 
and starting to gather some evidence of efficacy. Then we move on to phase three. This can take quite, quite a long time. And once all of that data is gathered, then a single drug submission is made to Health Canada. Health Canada has a standard 300 day review for new drugs. And this is, uh, we have faster pathways, but this is kind of the normal target mm -hmm. in a, in a non-urgent circumstance. After Health Canada, authorizes a drug, the public health agency and their a national advisory committee on immunization will make recommendations on prioritization of populations and make recommendations for how provinces should deploy that vaccine. Um, and as I mentioned, there's always a, a, a long term post market surveillance plan in place once once a product comes to market. And this entire process can take many years. So how do we do that faster without uh, sacrificing our, our, our normal standards? Go to the next slide, please. So really we're, we're do, thinking here is what can be, uh, what phases can, can overlap and how can you expedite some of this? A lot of the initial development of vaccines um, goes sequentially because there's a need to gather funding, to identify trial sites and that sort of thing. There's a, there's a lot of money in the system um, flowing from governments to support research and development, and that's kind of streamlining the initial development of, of products. As we're looking at the COVID products, um, we still expect to see safety and proof of concept studies done in animals before uh, any vaccine or any product starts, starts um, being used in humans. But certain animal studies can continue uh, once some of the human studies have begun. As I already mentioned, um, adaptive trial designs that seamlessly bring you uh, from early phases into later phases um, will streamline the clinical development process. And one of the things that will be really important for expediting things in Canada is not waiting until all of the phase three studies are done to begin reviewing the data. We are thinking about rolling submission processes so that as certain packages of data become available, we can start reviewing early. Uh, we still do expect to see very large controlled um, phase three trials of vaccines. We still expect to see that and most of the products which are starting to go into three, phase three studies are talking about populations of about 30,000 people. Um, for the controlled studies. So we'll expect to see that data and that's a, that's a, a significant amount of information we'll, we'll want to see. Um, but with a rolling submission, we can engage early and begin to look at the data as it begins to come available. Similarly, um, some of the public health processes may be able to start earlier looking at the same data. And as everyone has already seen, there have been announcements uh, about um, advanced purchase agreements and planning for potential uh, deployment of vaccines, all of that will rely on Health Canada approval. So we still have to grant market authorization on the basis of the, the data before a vaccine can be deployed in Canada. So I don't have timeline on this slide because um, I honestly don't know how much, how long it will take and it will be very dependent on the data that's available as these trials progress. But I think by engaging early and thinking about how we can be very, very flexible and start to look at the data as we go along, we can compress the timelines and hopefully make some vaccines available to Canada, uh, to Canadians as soon as possible. So with that, I can stop and pass it on to Monica. Thank you, Dr. Bettle. I really appreciate that. Uh, I will just note there's a number of questions that are coming in around the slides and the information. I will speak to this at the end, but this is being recorded and will be posted. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to our final, final speaker who will talk about the process and challenges of launching a new ma major vaccine initiative. Uh, so over to you, Dr. Noss. Thank you. Thank you very much and good morning from British Columbia. Um, so I've been asked to talk about the public health aspects of planning for population-based implementation of a COVID-19 vaccine program. And I'll briefly take you through that. I think that it's obvious that there's still a lot of unknowns about this. So at this point, we are planning based on the information that's available, but all of the planning will have to be adjusted as new information emerges. So could I have the next slide, please? And this is just my um, disclosure slide, and I have no conflicts of interest to declare. I'm a full-time public health physician 
employed through UBC at the BC Centre for Disease Control. Thank you. Next slide. So we've heard from uh, the, both the, the R&D side, and obviously we are reliant very much on uh, both academia, but also the private sector for development of these vaccines that will be implemented into public health immunization program. That's the expectation. And we also heard about the Health Canada role in terms of the regulatory approval process for these vaccines and including the modifications to those processes that are relevant to COVID-19 vaccines. And I'd like to focus a little bit more on the side of things uh, in anticipation and following the approval for use of these products. And uh, Megan has already referred to the National Advisory Committee on Immunization. That's an expert scientific advisory committee that makes recommendations for the use of vaccines in Canada. Historically, the focus has really been on advice for clinicians, but in recent years, they've broadened their mandate to recommendations that are applicable to public health considerations for immunization programs. And that committee interfaces very closely with the Canadian Immunization Committee, which is a federal, provincial, territorial committee supported by the Public Health Agency of Canada, as is NACI where information sharing between the provinces and territories occurs that's very relevant to program implementation, program evaluation, and program planning. And uh, as you probably know, all of our programs ultimately are implemented and determined at the provincial territorial level because health is a provincial territorial responsibility. I'd like to point out that I think we all uh, think that with planning for the COVID-19 vaccine programs, we will probably have a lot of harmonization around the planning and use of these products across the country. I don't expect that there's going to be a lot of provincial territorial variation in their use, but discussions very relevant to things like to what extent would differing epidemiology and occurrence of disease in the provinces and territories drive differential use. Might there be differences in target groups, for instance, or sequencing based on those types of considerations? So those are very salient to these discussions and are still things that are to be determined. Every provincial and territorial process has its own policy advisory committees or immunization committees. So those will also be active in this area in determining the best use. And there are also variations at the provincial and territorial level with respect to how our routine immunization programs are delivered. In some jurisdictions, they're delivered exclusively by public health nurses. In other provinces, we rely a lot on physicians to immunize, especially in childhood and also for the adult programs. But in other provinces, pharmacists have become an increasingly large uh, uh, immunizer group. And so considerations about how we're going to engage and which immunizers will be delivering these programs are also going to be very important at the, at the ground level. So could I have the next slide, please? I, I've put this slide up and, and the reference uh, that it uh, comes from. And this is, these are the considerations that are salient both to the National Advisory Committee on Immunization as well as provincial territorial programs with respect to planning for deployment of immunization programs. To some extent, I think people have a sense that we've already made the decision that these vaccines will be used. Uh, and this is a framework for decision making about whether vaccines should be integrated into publicly funded immunization programs. A lot of these processes will also be sped up. Some may be more important than others, but I think it's important uh, to know that this, these are all of the considerations that go into uh, contemplating the use of a vaccine. Uh, I'll just highlight a couple of them. For instance, number two, the vaccine characteristics. Right now, we don't know which vaccines are going to be approved for use. We expect that more than one may uh, come to the Canadian marketplace. And one question will be, will 
could these vaccines be used similarly in all populations or might they differentiate themselves in the clinical trials to have specific application to some populations more than others? So an important group to consider, for instance, are elderly individuals. And we know that not all vaccines perform equally well in the older immune system. The big example of that, of course, are the influenza vaccines, where over the last several years, we've had several vaccines differentiated as uniquely formulated to stimulate the elderly immune response. And that might be a consideration for COVID vaccine as well, because this is a target population of interest given the very high morbidity and mortality in elderly individuals with COVID-19. Uh, other considerations under number nine are things like the ethics, um, equity, uh, and also political considerations. So while many decisions are often based on recommendations from public health, you are probably all aware that politics in COVID has played a very significant role in decision making. And I think uh, our politicians will probably have a key role in making some of the decisions around how we use those vaccines and whether they might be differential use at a provincial territorial level as well. Could I have the next slide, please? Um, this is my final wordy slide, and I, I do have a lot of words on this slide, and I'm just going to take you through it briefly. So we've heard, we haven't heard actually at this presentation what the timing of availability uh, could be, but we've uh, certainly heard a lot in the media, uh, including the U.S. program, with some very early contemplated availability, but that's a big unknown, I think, uh, at this point in time, and so we are planning for uh, various eventualities. I've, I, I think uh, for recommendations for target populations and sequencing, the important decisions there will be what are the primary goals, especially early on when vaccine supply may be limited, and we'll have to make some decisions about sequencing and who gets vaccinated first. So give, giving you an example of that our, um, you know, is our primary goal to reduce morbidity and mortality, including intensive care and deaths, or is our primary goal to minimize societal disruption? Um, are essential services workers, uh, and how high should they be on the sequencing scale? Those types of decisions, which are also very relevant when we plan for influenza pandemic response. Uh, dosing, dosing en route. Right now, all of our assumptions for injection supplies have been based on the assumption that these are going to be delivered intramuscularly and that two doses may be required, but some of those may change depending on which vaccines are progressing through that approvals pipeline. Storage and distribution of vaccines is important. All of our vaccines have to be maintained under cold chain, which for all of our current products is two to eight degrees refrigeration. And that's what our infrastructure is built on. But some of these vaccines may require freezer storage, including very cold freezer storage. And that's something we would need to plan for in advance because that infrastructure does not exist in Canada. I've already mentioned issues around delivery systems and providers and settings. I think uh, you know that we can't deliver mass clinics in the same way that we used to because of the need for physical distancing and infection prevention in these settings. So looking at how to deliver these vaccines safely as we are currently doing in our other immunization programs will be important. The vaccine, we haven't had discussions at uh, any table that I sit at about what a threshold for vaccine efficacy would be acceptable for use of a vaccine. But historically, it's been contemplated that perhaps even a, even a low efficacy might be relevant to consider for deployment of vaccines. So those are important considerations as well. The reference to safety and making sure that we have good systems for assessment of safety before approval for use, but also after use are very important. Immunization coverage assessment, and that's the proportion of the population, including different segments of the population that are vaccinated and follow through on a second dose if that's required, will be important to know both in advance so that we can correct things like misconceptions and so on, but also throughout the campaign, assuming that this is launched as a campaign. 
and there will be a variety of unknowns prior to uh, the deployment of these programs and it's going to be important to collect that information as the programs roll out. So an, a question, for instance, if these vaccines have a short duration of protection, what are the implications for subsequent vaccination, say three years later, if people need to receive booster doses, do those have to be given with the same vaccine? Can they be given with a different vaccine? All of those will be important questions to addressing the out years. And then if you could turn to my final slide, please. And then uh, finally, I just wanted to highlight the very important issues related to ongoing communication, not only to the public who will be recipients of these vaccines, but also to our healthcare providers who will be delivering these vaccines and engaging on a one-on-one -on -one level with all uh, members of the public, ongoing uh, addressing of any misconceptions that arise, but also providing information as it becomes available to us and being transparent in that process, I think is going to be very critical. And then the, my other uh, cartoon there is around the evaluation. There will be lots and lots and lots of opportunities and needs for evaluating all aspects of these programs in order to fine tune their delivery as they roll out. Thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Noss. Uh, we have about 10 minutes for questions and I will say the question box has been very active. Um, so I just wanna let folks know that we will not be able to get through all of the questions, uh, but I'll, I will try and uh, pick out the questions that uh, theme up a number of, of, of questions that have been asked. Um, so I think the first one uh, to you, uh, Dr. Neem is, um, appreciating that um, you presented on a number of different types of vaccines. There's an, a few questions around, do we know which one of those types is like, likely to be most uh, effective? And um, from that perspective, you know, how does that fit into the, the work that's being done uh, by research and how does that fit into the regulatory process, Megan, um, if we know in advance? I'll start with that then. So, I mean, um, Dr. Nouse actually made mention of this. I mean, first of all, you know, we're going to need 8 billion doses of vaccine, and that could be two doses. So that's 16 billion doses. So um, it's going to be a number of different types, most likely, that are going to be coming to the forefront, which will be sent to um, Health Canada and Megan's group for evaluation and, and potential licensure. Um, and I think that the thing that's most important, also Dr. Nouse mentioned this as well, is that I think it, it looks like different populations may need different vaccines. So it's a difficult to answer your question because it, it, that will be the big part of it. Will a senior, a person 65 years age and older need a different type of uh, vaccine um, compared to, to a child? It's just gonna be quite difficult to understand. My hope is that multiple vaccines complete their phase three trials, submit to Health Canada, and, and Megan's group will then uh, consider them for, for licensure. Thanks. And may, Megan, maybe uh, in responding as well, if you could talk to what do you, how many vaccines do you think we will end up having in Canada? And uh, again, I know you didn't put a timeline on, um, but um, do you see a number of them coming to fruition around the same time, or this will be something that will roll out over, over many months? Uh, that is, is a very good question because I think um, the development is moving quite quickly. There are now a few which have just started phase three studies. Um, at this point, it's difficult to predict um, how long it will take to do those studies because in part it'll depend on where the trials are, how long it takes to enroll people, and then the length of, of follow-up on that. Um, how many vaccines do we expect? I would hope for several, maybe five, maybe six. I know certainly we have been engaging with almost everyone who's making a vaccine and has a legitimate candidate uh, to, to understand what the, what the processes are and what the timelines might be. Um, but everything's going to depend on the data. So many products fail in their phase three study. So if, if they do not have the data showing that it works, then we won't see those submissions. So I would hope for several, and I would not expect to see them until 
next year. Okay. Thanks, certainly Dr. not this calendar year. Thanks. Dr. Noss, I don't know if this question is appropriate for you, but I'm curious about that, this question. And so if you're not the right person, feel free to, uh, to redirect it. But there is a question regarding whether there's a correlation between the flu vaccine, the pneumonia vaccine, and the possible COVID-19 vaccine. Um, I don't know if the question is really about COVID-19 vaccine or COVID-19 disease. There, there has been an analysis, uh, or, or are there been questions about whether uh, receipt of influenza vaccine does affect the severity of COVID disease, for instance, and that's been examined and uh, there's nothing to indicate that that's the case. But are you, I, I wonder, if, is the question about whether these COVID vaccine could be co-administered with influenza vaccine? I, I think that this is probably going to be one of the questions that we're going to have to have an expert opinion about. And oftentimes these co-administration studies aren't available at the time of approval. With childhood vaccines, that question often is studied in the expectation that a newly approved vaccine like the meningococcal B vaccine will be integrated into the routine childhood immunization schedule. So the vaccines administered at those milestones are specifically studied for, with respect to interference as well as uh, reactogenicity, you know, the, the pain, redness and swelling at the injection site, things like fever. I'm, I'm suspecting that none of the COVID vaccine clinical trials will be taking a look at co-administration with other vaccines specifically, and a lot of that information will have to become available after the fact. And in their initial use, there will be reliance on the National Advisory Committee on immunization to make recommendations about whether those vaccines should be given by themselves or whether they can be co-administered with other vaccines. If, for instance, this vaccine rolls out during the fall when we would regularly be giving influenza. Thank you, Dr. Nash. Um, Megan, uh, I think you, you indicated that you anticipated that phase three trials would, have, would be taking place in other countries uh, based on the prevalence of illness in our, our country at this point in time. Um, one of the questions raised was, how do we know this, that the strain of the virus will end up being the same in those countries as we will be exposed to in, in uh, Canada? So uh, obviously the concerns about change over time. Yeah, so I'm, I'm not sure uh, how much data there, there is at this point showing um, a lot of variability of the virus. I mean, there, there, there are certain some reports of, of different strains, but I think the, um, the S protein, which is the target of all of the vaccines, has been relatively consistent. So we can, we can look to uh, characterization of, of the virus in different countries where the, where the vaccines have been tested. We could look at um, how uh, we could look at the diagnostic tests which are used to identify the vaccine. So there are a number of means to, to look at how consistent things are across the world, but I don't think we have a, a huge concern that there would be so much evolution of, of the virus that, that we, we would not be able to trust the, the results of the vaccine. Um, I don't know if Diana, you have any specific comments as, as well, but I think, I, think, I think what we're seeing so far is that we would expect fairly consistent results from country to country. Yeah, I mean, that, that's uh, yeah, very, very true. Um, so thank you for that. I, I mean, basically at this point in time, we are focusing on the S protein and the S protein, are, we're seeing a few changes. I mean, these viruses, coronavirus, influenza viruses, they mutate, they constantly mutate. Um, whether they're going to survive or not with that mutation, well, that will just, it's, it's, we're gonna have to see. They, there seems to be a little bit more virulence in regard to transmissibility uh, in regard to the, the mutations that have occurred, but nothing really that's substantially changed in the S protein. So our vaccines seem to be um, in the right place and the right, uh, on the right line. But I would suggest probably we would be looking though to you know, countries that are having studies that are a little bit closer to us. So we probably look at the United States and, the, and those studies are gonna be fairly consistent with us in Canada because we're in North America. Thank you. Um, uh, I just are gonna do two more questions um, and then wrap up. Uh, we're almost out of time. Uh, so maybe one question for you, Dr. Noss, is a question that was raised about um, how has the H1N1 experience and planning for that been leveraged um, and the pandemic planning um, at this point for what might be a vaccination program been leveraged to be able to assist your thinking for COVID? 
I think I think it's very useful to have had that rehearsal uh, about a decade ago in 2009. But I think that this is a very different uh, planning process. I think that with influenza vaccines, the production processes, the advanced plans, the domestic contracts, and so on are all in place. And we generally have a pretty good idea about the timeline for when the vaccine will be available. That's always been an issue for influenza vaccines as well. And, and there's been interest in development of new technologies in order to have access to influenza vaccines uh, sooner. But I think that there are a lot of differences between influenza pandemic uh, preparedness and responding to an emerging pathogen about which a lot of information is still you know, coming to light. Uh, so while I think um, there, are, there is some reliance on our pandemic preparedness plans, like the assumption that two doses for the entire population will be required, and our infrastructure and injection supply planning for that type of mass campaign, I think that what actually happens with this a vaccine might be, these vaccines might be substantially different. Um, so I think, yes, there are some similarities and some benefits of having that process, but I think there'll have to be some unique considerations in this as well. Um, I, the last question for Dr. Neiman, Dr. Battle, um, a question that was raised about um, sort of the way that we normally do things. So sharing of research data is always critical to the development and treatment of, of vaccine options. Um, at the same time, you know, the history has been that these entities, including um, academic institutions, are, are very keen to protect their intellectual property. Um, so can you maybe talk uh, just a, a comment about what efforts are being made to help break down those barriers to be able to expedite um, uh, the, the, the successful launch of vaccines for Canada and, and worldwide? Well, maybe I can start with that. I, I have not seen this type and this level of collaboration in 25 years of my career. Um, Dr. Nass and Dr. Battle can speak to that, but I have been so um, moved, essentially, by the fact that, you know, we're reaching out to each other. I mean, here's a prime example of, uh, on, this, on this webinar of the different stakeholders that are involved working together talking together i mean it's a it's a it's a i mean it's a silly kind of phrase but we're 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 better when we work together i mean and and for me i've seen that i understand where the question comes from but i've been very as i say very moved that we haven't really followed that we've actually been very collaborative and maybe i'll pass that to dr bell yeah i i would say the same thing i think um i think there's been huge investment in in science uh, in Canada and internationally, the way the the regulators are working together and sharing information to make sure that we're we're taking a consistent approach. And um, the, the way information is being published very quickly, possibly a bit too quickly sometimes, but um, just that that sharing of information to help inform research and to get trial results out. So, um, so patients who, who need options may be transferred to other options or, you know, so that there can be best treatment. I think, I think the collaborative scientific response has been fantastic to see. Thank you. So we are at the last minute. Um, so just in wrap up, I do want to extend a huge thank you to our speakers. Um, obviously lots to come and actually one of the questions was, is there a follow up to this? So you obviously hit the mark with people um, with lots of interest. Uh, for everyone that participated, the session was recorded and will be posted on CADIS YouTube channel later this week. A short evaluation survey will be open in a new window when you exit the webinar. Please do take a moment to fill it out. It really does help us. Uh, CADIS COVID webinar series will return on Tuesday, August 25th with a session on blood plasma therapies. And until then, continue to wash your hands, wear a mask and be safe. Thank you again for everyone for uh, joining and thank you again to the speakers for such a great dialogue.